Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Pedro Alonso, and this is Shepard Ferry. Hello. <laughs> so, <laughs> Shepard, can you show him your hands? Because uh, he's been working. Yeah, I just, just came from doing a, a mural. Sorry, I was, if I kept you all waiting three minutes or whatever. That's, it's like, that's better than hip hop time, though, right? <laughs> I guess it yeah, is. Art yeah. time versus hip hop time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Shepard is one of the most committed artists I've ever met. Um, I don't know how much, how aware you are of, of his work and his practice, but you know, for this, you know, season at at the fair, he has three mural projects up. Um, last night he ha gave a dinner party, and today, oh, and late last night you DJed for Dr. Dre. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Can you, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you do it? Um, I, I just love what I do. And, um, you know, you're on this uh, planet for a finite amount of time, and I figure I'm, I'm going to make the best of it. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a type 1 diabetic, and this gets into this really deep existential stuff. But anyway, my dad told me when I first was diagnosed with diabetes, um, you know, he's, he has a way of delivering things in a really uplifting fashion. He said, well, son, you're probably going to live about 20 years less than most people. So um, I guess ever since then, I felt like the clock was ticking. There was an urgency. And, and also, uh, you know, I, um, what else am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, your, your work is composed of a series of core images that you repeat continually. Um, and I, I think it'd be great if, if you talked a bit about the process of, of making those core images and why you repeat them so much. Because, you know, there's, there's always this question of, you know, people will ask me, is that work a unique piece? Is that original? You know, and, and I, I'd like to, it's important to hear what you have to say about that. I assume that some people are, are reasonably familiar with uh, a lot of my work. Um, you know, this is... The, I call the icon face. It's a, uh, an abstracted version of this Andre the Giant has a posse sticker that I made in 1989 as an inside joke with a skateboarder friend. Put some stickers around on some stop signs and at some skate spots in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, noticed that um, there was an interesting public reaction. The local free newspaper ran a, a story about what is this mysterious sticker campaign. And um, I decided to make that an icon that I would repeat because just with very little money and um, a bit of effort, I had um, somehow created something that was getting, um, getting attention and piquing people's curiosity. And I felt that that needed to be a consistent thread through things I was doing. So even as I uh, evolved the vocabulary of, uh, of, of images, um, that there were some constants. And the other, the other constant... Um, other than a few um, main sort of logos or elements that I use, motifs that I use, is um, the color palette, um, red, black, and white, which evolved for um, both out of, out, of, uh, out of necessity, my, my budget dictating my aesthetic. I, um, I was making free posters at Kinko's by rigging the machine with a paper clip to yield free copies, and uh, they had a red toner cartridge and a black toner cartridge. So that was it, could use red and black. But I also really loved a lot of um, propaganda posters, uh, Barbara Kruger's work, and I felt that red and black were really um, used a lot in advertising to good effect. And uh, so no matter how much my work um, evolves um, incorporating new stylistic elements, it always feels somewhat cohesive because some of the mo motifs um, repeat and the color, the color palette is reasonably consistent. So, um, you know, my practice is I make, um, when I started, no one was buying anything I was making, by the way. So um, I had to make everything very, very inexpensively. And I started by making 18 by 24 posters, which was the largest size I could screen print by hand. And, um, and then I would, I would make 100 on thicker paper to hopefully at some point sell, but then I would make a few hundred on thin paper to put up on the street. And um, I've continued that. I've made larger images, but because I couldn't make really large pieces by, uh, by screen printing then, I decided I would tile them up the way that Warhol would do the, the, 
the Coca-Cola or the multiple dollar signs or Warhol heads, I mean, or Maryland heads, and, uh, and, and, and take over larger spaces in public with, uh, with the grid system. So with a consistent color palette and that format, um, that's how I worked, and I still utilize that, but now I make really huge images, and I also make um, patterns that repeat that are still formed from 18 by 24 posters, but that can create a rhythm in a really large installation between smaller images, patterns, and larger images. You know, th another key aspect of your work is um, the distribution. When you, when you started the Andre the Giant Has a Posse campaign, you um, accidentally invented, you know, viral marketing. <laughs> you know, um, uh, because you were producing it yourself, you were paying for the production of the stickers, you were yeah. paying for shipping stickers, and you were advertising in skateboard magazines um, to get people to call him so he would send them stickers. And at one point, he couldn't afford it anymore. So he, um, you had to charge a dime, right? Yeah. A dime yeah. a sticker. And a then that turned sticker. into a business. That's right. Not a good, not a very good business, <laughs> well, yeah. but a yeah. business. And, but, you know, the, the really interesting thing about this is how it, it, it really looks at the model of the internet today and how we're looking at, you know, viral dissemination as mm -hmm. well as the, the, the internet business model where, you know, a company like YouTube can provide a service. It's a huge success. And all of a sudden, then you have to figure out how can we turn this into a business? And a lot of your, your, your career has been based on identifying these opportunities and, and running with them. Well, I think the, the first uh, thing for me was to um, differentiate what I was doing from traditional commercial ventures because, um, for one thing, a lot of the work I was making was really designed to call into question conspicuous consumption and the control of public space so if what I was doing looked identical to every other business, um, it wouldn't have the same effect as feeling uh, a little bit unique. And it had to sustain itself somehow, so there had to be some revenue generating component, but by charging very little for the stickers, giving a lot of stuff away, putting stuff up in the street that was clearly not uh, advertising anything because I didn't really have many products um, at the time, um, I think people were, they were intrigued. They felt like once they, I, I wrote a, a, a thing that I called my manifesto, which sort of explained a lot of the psychology behind um, the sticker campaign. And it, it talks about phenomenology, which is a, a theory um, that uh, was, was uh, developed by Martin Heidegger, which uh, it says that people have become numb to their surroundings and they need unique experiences to re reawaken a sense of wonder about their environment. So I, I felt that whatever I was doing, even if it had a commercial component, still needed to um, utilize uh, phenomenology. So uh, giving away stickers, making proof sheets that worked like a chain letter, and having people feel like they were participating in something that was a little bit subversive and um, not too commercial um, really created a meme, and that's the, that's the important thing here. That's what the internet does a lot. You know, everybody's seen this one video because it gets forwarded a, a zillion times. I kind of created that with, uh, with a sticker. Can you t share how many you've distributed in 20 years? <laughs> well, I, um, you know, I started off, I thought I'd done a lot the first year because I printed 60,000 stickers that year, um, but then it's gone up and up and up, and I think I've been... I've been at around you know, 800,000 to a million stickers a year for the last few years. So I, I figure it's probably around 10, 12, 15 million now. <laughs> <laughs> and they've shown up literally all over the world. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm tracking you or I know where you've been because I see them you know, <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, they get out there. They're yeah. harder to take down than they are to put up. That's a good thing. <laughs> And then, so, but now, I mean, people can like order them online or, you know, this is something that's commercially available. Yeah, you can, you can order my stickers online and they're, they're still um, relatively inexpensive. But I used to, anybody that emailed me, I would send stickers and posters free to them if they said they wanted to put them up. But then, you know, supply and demand kicks in. And uh, my, my book's name, Supply and Demand. 
because all of a sudden around 2000, I started seeing sticker packs and poster packs that I sent out to people to theoretically, you know, join in the revolution, you know, and, uh, uh, and, they're, and they were on eBay. So then I started sending the posters out folded so they'd have a big fat crease in them so they were harder to eBay. But one of the Obama posters with a, with a crease through it still sold for um, $1,200 really? on eBay. Yeah. But um, I, 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 now what I do is if I know someone and they want stuff, I'll, you know, I'll give it to them. And uh, uh, everybody else has uh, the option to download many of my images free off my site, high resolution, and do whatever they want with them except for make bootleg T-shirts and sell them uh, in, in mass. They can make a couple for themselves, but, you know. Well, you know, there's a, a, a very interesting story about, you know, Shepard did this really great show in Boston, and uh, there were a lot of outdoor works. And, and the fact that Shepard was in a museum, you know, in many ways challenged your street credibility. And, and this was manifested one day when we were um, in, a, in, a, in one of the murals that he'd done. Some, a kid had come by and, and tagged bitch. And, um, you know, so we cleaned it off. And three weeks later, someone came in with a spray can and, and wrote, please do not disgrace my city with this ludicrous abomination. Now, that's not something an 18-year-old kid is going to write. And um, later witnesses reported that it was two women in their 40s who did it. And, um, and, and that, that, that situation of reconciling, you know, this, you're kind of in limbo. Because you know you're you're you know you're you're having great success in the art world. You're en entering the art world in a big way, but at the same time, you're challenged with your with your roots. How do you reconcile that? Well, to me, um, it all comes down to um, what the end goals are, and also recognizing how things evolve. Um, you know, the end goal for me was always to make people realize that art can affect things. And whether it's just a piece of expression that's therapeutic for the creator that they're sharing with an audience or it's got an, an overt political message, um, I think that art is very underutilized as a tool of communication. So for me, putting my work in the street was a way to connect with a broad audience. I'm, I'm, I'm a populist. But another way of connecting with an audience is printing stuff on T-shirts, doing things for bands uh, on album covers, um, uh, and then showing in galleries and showing in museums. To me, it's uh, the opportunities for cross-pollination are very powerful. And um, the idea of these, these, uh, these categories that have um, very defined borders is, um, is both unrealistic and unhealthy. And um, so, you know, in Boston, the really great thing was that the museum understood my practice. They helped me secure many outdoor murals, and um, I secured a few additional ones on my own. Um, and, um, and you know, and they also did a fantastic job showing the work in the museum, along with videos that showed um, various, you know, installations I had done, skateboarding, you know, every everything that really makes up the culture that my project is about. Um, so I thought that. You know, for the street artists that seen my work in the street to go into the museum and see it presented in a way that actually would give them some hope that what they that what they do can can be validated and maybe make them a living at some point. Um, that's that's really valuable. And then the person that goes to the museum that's never considered street art valid that now goes outdoors and looks at the streets um, with a different point of view. That's, that's really significant, too. And my work's always been about creating debate. Um, it's been provocative. And so, you know, that I've become a lightning rod for um, it, various ends of the spectrum is, um, you know, sometimes unpleasant, but, um, but really uh, uh, indifference would be um, far worse. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you um, there's no lack of uh, attention. People are, I think she needs to give you something. Sorry. No. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Sorry. Um, you know, Shepard. In insulin, there's that diabetes thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, Shepard, um, you know, you, you have, I mean, one of the, the tenets of your work is really accessibility. I mean, you've, you've gone out of your way to put it in front of people. 
uh, you make work that is conceptually accessible as well. I mean, people get it. Your references are, are very clear. They're, they're drawing from popular culture. And then, um, and then it's also financially. I mean, you, you sell your prints, for instance, or the stickers. You, you make things that really anyone can afford, and you sell your prints for way below you know, market value. Uh, mm. At the same time, you're a capitalist. You know, you're because you are. You're, you're. You know, you have a clothing line. You're, and 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 a lot of people. You know, I've heard pe you know, people have told me. You know, that guy's he's kind of a hypocrite. And I and I and it's a very it's a you know. But these are about these lines you're talking about. And and people often want to put you in a box. And and you don't you don't let us. You make it really tough for us to put you in a box. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I mean, it's to me. Um, there's a big difference. Um, between making work that finds an audience and that audience wants to um, own a piece, um, connect with it, um, and then that being, uh, and then you receive some sort of financial compensation for that, um, and the financial side being what's driving you. Um, in fact, what, you know, to get back to you know the idea of, of people wanting to purchase something and, and even if it's at a, a affordable price, when I was at RISD and I uh, I wrote Rhode Island School of Design, I guess everyone here knows that, right? You're all like yeah, um, hip to the art school slang around here. Um, I um I had some people say you know well what you're doing is really fascinating. I think that um the psychology of it is interesting and I think you could get a grant and you could, you know, you could make your stickers and your posters and you could put them around and then you could, you know, write up, uh, you know, an interesting case study on what happened and, um, and, and I thought, you know what, I really need to succeed by this working through the normal um, forces of, of consumer and pop culture that's going to be the measure of whether it succeeded because the intellectual world probably doesn't need to um, you know, benefit from some of the ideas, some of the provocation in the way that the, the rest of the public does. So I don't want this to be a sort of isolated, incubated thing. I want it to have to really deal with what's going on in the real world. And um, you know, I look at uh, the things that have happened for me financially, which have been much more recent. And, you know, it's great. I have a family and um, I can support them. And I lived in poverty in, uh, for the first 10, 12 years of my career. Um, this is a byproduct of what I do. It's not the end goal. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, Michael Moore is a, a millionaire, but still, what he does is pretty awesome, right? Does anyone say, you shouldn't make great documentaries that make money, dude, yeah. you know? Um, anyway, um, you know, I do a lot of philanthropic work, and that's, uh, charity is, is a luxury. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm not having to scrape from month to month, and I can put my energy into things where I can donate art and donate money um, to things I care about, and, um, you know, that's, that's, how, I, uh, that's how, how I sort of balance things. Yeah, because um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, over half of your career, at least, I mean, the first 15 years, you really gave very little attention to the art world. I mean, you were really engaged in this campaign. And, and, and why, why, you know, why, why weren't you interested in the art world? I mean... I, I, think I, I, I think I wasn't that interested in the art world just because it was such a narrow conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I love a lot of pop art, Jasper Johns, Rauschenberg, Warhol, uh, you know, through art history, there's great people, Duchamp, uh, um, you know, people who mix sort of pranks and, 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 and art like the Situationists, uh, what Jamie Reed did for the Sex Pistols inspired by the Situationists, um, but um, not so much of it is just about the fine art world, it's more the spillover into the rest of culture that I've been I've been impressed by with a lot of those people. Um, you know, I was just as inspired by skateboard graphics and t-shirt graphics and album cover graphics as I was by, by museums. Now, I, I've gained a greater appreciation for what goes on in, in, uh, in, in galleries and museums. And that's what I think um, what people really 
uh, respond to when it comes to fine art is this idea that someone is able to approach something with absolutely pure intentions. And, um, and that's why people get a little apprehensive about commercial things because they think that maybe the, the agenda isn't to make you know, art mm -hmm. in, with a capital A, but it's to make something that can sell something. Um, and, and I do appreciate that part of art, but I always felt like um, the conversation should be broader than the art world. Yeah. And I still do. Yeah, because in many ways, your, your practice has spilled over into the art world. It, it kind of a, the, the reverse. The trickle what, up is what yeah, I call it. Yeah, the trickle up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one of the, the again, your commitment, your, you know, Shepard is very committed to his work. He's, you know, working all the time. And I think that one of the things for you is really about getting the work out there. You're, you're, um, you know, you want your images to be seen. You want people to know them. And, um, but, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it, you've, you've, tr you've worked with many, many mediums, clothing. I mean, is, is that the end goal, to get it out there? Well, I, I think that the phase of my career of needing to um, put something into the public uh, you know, consciousness, um, I think I did that reasonably well with the Obey campaign, but if, um, if you weren't uh, aware of that, then with the Obama thing, now it's just, uh, if you have a television or, or a computer, it's hard not to know that image, the hope image, even if you don't know me by name. So um, I think for many, many years, I was focused on um, quantity yeah. and, and quality to a degree, but quality, you know, kind of uh, uh, grading it on a curve that I wanted to uh, put a ton of crap out there. And um, now I think I'm being a little bit, I'm just as busy as ever, if not busier, but I'm also trying to really focus my energy into making some stuff that, that's, that's very high quality. Um, <laughs> in terms of what my capabilities are. Um, yeah, my quality is, you know, other people uh, can, you know, way above that. But, but yeah, do the best I can. And, it, and like I said before about the luxury of, of uh, you know, w when you are doing well in your career, the things that you can do, um, now I can actually take longer on pieces of, of work because there, um, you know, there's a, there's a base of collectors that are, willing to pay a reasonable price. And I would feel bad about that, that I was narrowing the supply of my images and charging more if I didn't have the posters and the t-shirts of the same images that I make. But, um, you know, uh, one thing is a lot of art is very ephemeral, especially street art. So the idea of how my work evolved from this do-it-yourself, um, grassroots activist sort of approach to um, being uh, in the Boston ICA and the Warhol Museum. Um, the, the, the great thing about that is even though the work will fade from the walls um, and the t-shirts will, will uh, get thrown away eventually, maybe the idea that that led to some things that um, were taken more seriously and, and, and seemed a little more permanent in art history, that really gets to the heart of the grassroots activism and the whole project. So. It is important for me in a lot of ways to have that side, um, the more fine art side, be acknowledged because the backstory has to simultaneously be acknowledged. Yeah, no, that's, that's, it, you know, and you and there are several artists of your genre, the, you know, the street art genre, who, you know, who were dedicating a lot of time and resources to, you know, these, these almost a feudal campaign where you're going out and you're putting up these posters, it's costing you money. And then, um, at, but at the same time, over time, there was, um, you know, it, in a way it was like a marketing campaign because people started to see these things, get interested in them, and, and want them. And, and there was a really interesting convergence between the, again, the internet and the prints. So, you know, you, Banksy, Fail, a lot of you guys really started as printmakers. That was like the medium mm -hmm. that not only, um, that was that well that allowed you to make street art, but also that um, helped you help you helped you make money to stay alive. Can you tell us a bit about you know you know prints and how you went from prints to the the fine art. Well, 
um, screen printing was something I fell in love with while I was in college um, because I, I majored in illustration and I enjoyed drawing and painting, but I also really liked photography and I got into uh, collage and mixed media and uh, appropriated elements while I, was in, while I was in college. And the way that I could synthesize all these things that I liked into something cohesive was through printmaking. Yeah. And also, I, um, I always had a fear that when I worked on one precious original, a painting or a drawing or a one-off, um, was that I either didn't push the piece far enough or I tried something risky and ruined it, went too far. But with a screen print, I could have an idea of how I wanted the, the, the piece to work, but then I could also experiment. And this is, uh, you know, I'm 39, I went through RISD from 88 to 92, and desktop publishing was really just coming in at the end of my stint at RISD, so I never learned how to use the computer, so I never had the ability to mock up compositions and then experiment with them on the computer like I do now, so I did it all manually with screen printing. But you end up getting a lot of really um, interesting failed experiments, but you also you know, use your screens and you get some great things that you might not have uh, done if you had thought, well, this is just the one I'm gonna do. So the idea of having multiples to be able to experiment, to be able to give some away, put some up on the street, share some, it's really um, very valuable. But um, even with my fine art, I still utilize screen printing, but I hand cut spray paint stencils. I paint back in with a brush. I use collage. I print my own, my own patterns. I use found newspapers and collage elements. Um, so there's a lot of different tools going into it, but they all really are, are similar to things that kind of evolved out of um, needing to work quickly and efficiently for the street and to sell prints um, to fund the ones I'm putting up on the street, et cetera. So really, I mean, my fine art practice isn't all that different from what I've done as, a, as an artist for 20 years now. Perfect. Um, we're, we're running out of time, but we would like to open it up for, for a question. One of the things that really, to me, blew up your work was when I played uh, the game Getting Up, Mark Echo created it. Mm -hmm. um, I was blown away. I, I was like, oh my god, uh, Andre has a boss. I just started flipping out when I saw it. Do you see yourself doing any future projects in video games with the Obase logo? You know, that was a really um, interesting project because, you know, Doing, doing a video game or, or, or you know, anything else commercial can, can create a backlash. But um, Mark Echo had uh, asked a lot of very important graffiti artists to be involved in that game. And um, the model was sort of based on you know, Tony Hawk Pro Skateboarder. Tony, uh, that did huge things in terms of validating Tony Hawk's career and all the other people that were characters in that game. And, and for me to be asked as the only non-New Yorker to be in the game getting up um, with Futura, with Scene, with um, Cope, I mean, amazing people, um, that, was a, that was a really tremendous honor. And, uh, and the, you know, the game is fun. And the way I looked at it is it might seem silly to some people that do real street art. And, and in a lot of ways, I'm actually very opposed to the complacency of video games, sitting around playing a video game instead of being out doing something. But if it's the gateway drug to real street art, I'm all for that. So, um, you know, I love the idea of a 12-year-old who doesn't know anything about these people becoming curious about the culture, looking up on the internet and going, this guy who's a character, that's a real person that took real risks, that did really amazing things. I want to learn how to do that. So that's, uh, that's that. I, um, I probably, I don't have any plans on any future video games, but my friend Z Trips and uh, um, a new uh, DJ hero, which is the DJ equivalent. Uh, actually, I'm friends with a couple guys in that game because I, I DJ. And, uh, and I did some, uh, some poster illustrations of some of the characters. And that's a fun project. Anything that can promote culture that I think is cool. Um, you know, some people might think it's silly, but I think it's a great way to, uh, you know, really just put the spotlight on uh, innovators in the DJ world. One more. A couple of years ago, I visited some friends in Berlin, and they showed me that on the side of their beautiful old building, there was a piece of art that I think they called glue-on art or something, basically work on paper that had been 
glued on, and they were going to get rid of it. They were going to scrub it off, but then somebody told them that the artist who put it on was very famous, and there was a sense in what they were told that it would be shameful to remove it because it was important culturally. How reverent have people tended to be towards your work that's in public places, public spaces, and has there been a difference from country to country if your work <laughs> has gone into some different countries? Um, you know, I actually try to be very reverent about where I put my works. I, if, it, if it's a nice old building, um, I'm not gonna put my work on it because I respect architecture and history. Um, when I'm in Paris and my friends are like, hey, there's an awesome cathedral, you should put a huge Andre head on it, you know? I'm like, no, no, they, you know, they're surrounded by that stuff and really desensitized to it, but um, I think it's important to try to integrate the work in a way that's respectful. But there, there, you know, there are derelict spaces and there, you know, there are places where I think street art's appropriate. Um, a lot of people are not reverent at all towards my work and some people are and that's the great thing about public art is you don't get the emperor's new clothes phenomenon that you get when you walk into a gallery and everybody goes, this thing's on a pedestal, maybe just figuratively, maybe literally. I better find some sort of merit in it or I'm the dumb guy in the room. On the street, it's like Beavis and Butthead. It's either like, that's cool or that's whack, you know, like. <laughs> Um, and no one, no one feels um, in any way inhibited about saying or writing or tearing or expressing their love or hate of the piece. And um, that's part of it. That's really, um, that's a great thing. It's very democratic. Um, but I do, uh, you know, I, I work hard doing my stuff, so I like it when it stays up for a while. But it's, uh, you know, it's like the mama sea turtle. She knows uh, 50 are going to be born, five will make it to the sea. You know, you just, you just live with it. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about if you had any good war stories from you know the subversive nature of your work. If you've gone out and gotten into some trouble, or what you've got no, to have never. some stories of of those times. Because I mean, I, I was hoping you'd come to the Citadel in Charleston and put up one of your works, but <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. Did so. you go to the Citadel? I'm in their grad school program. Uh, your, your hair's so. grown out. Yeah, yeah. So that's a military school, by the yeah. way. It's um. It's where they got in big trouble because um, the, f the female applicant, Shannon, she didn't put what gender, and Shannon could be male or female, and uh, this is a big hullabaloo. But anyway, um, my friend's dad was the admissions officer. He was demoted after that. Um, no, I, uh, I've gotten in trouble. I've been arrested 15 times for doing street art, and um, usually it's just a misdemeanor. It's sort of, uh, you know, it, it's an it's, uh, occupational hazard. And... Um, if I were to stop doing what I do as a street artist because I'd been arrested, in many ways I'd be submitting to the very same forces the art is designed to call into question. Um, I'm not trying to make the cops mad. I'm, not, I'm not, not out there just to antagonize them. That's once again just a byproduct of the act itself. Um, but I, uh, you know, there's tons of stories that um, are really, really funny and I'd love to tell them, but we don't have time about being arrested. But, uh, you know, the, the thing for me is that, um, you know, a lot of laws are, are, uh, are enforced selectively and um, graffiti laws or street art laws are, you know, it's a, uh, if, if the economy is terrible and people are um, worried about other crimes, it's a cosmetic thing that tends to, um, tends to placate the, the fears that everything is crumbling and decaying into chaos, um, you know, um, it descending into chaos and uh, you know people fear what they don't understand a lot of people don't understand street art or graffiti so I understand why they're the, the those laws and why they're enforced sometimes the way they are but I um, you know I've chosen to not be um, secretive about my identity because I think that it's important to articulate why the work is there and um, and and what some of the some of the merits are of it so that people don't just call the cops as soon as they see somebody doing doing a piece, but that's always gonna happen. And uh, you know, I, I think that the, the whole conversation about the pros and cons of it are, you know, it's a good conversation to have. Yeah. Um, I wanted to hear you talk about how, how far before Barack's um, nomination, were you zeroing in on him? Uh, what made you pay attention to him first before his nomination? And 
Yeah, talk about what about him inspired you to make that poster. Um, his speech at the Democratic Convention in 2004 was um, what put him um, uh, on, on the map for me. Um, I, I thought that that was a strong speech in terms of um, its optimistic, uh, you know, aspirational side, but also um, the, the saying, but we, we, as a nation, we have problems, and, and it being um, a little bit somber at times. I thought it was a really skillful balance. And then I looked into some of his policy positions, and um, he opposed the war in Iraq when it was a very unpopular thing to do. He, um, he believed in decreasing the power of lobbyists in Washington. He believed in green energy and, and protecting the environment, um, health care reform, workers' rights, a lot of the things that, that really resonated with me. And, um, I, you know, when he announced his candidacy, I, um, I went and I watched a bunch of things on YouTube and I, I read about him. Um, and I actually wanted to do a poster for him before the primary and uh, uh, the primaries even started, the primaries and caucuses even started. But I didn't want to just make a poster and have it be, you know, fuel for Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity, and those other idiots to say, um, look at the company Obama keeps, a radical who's been arrested 15 times for transgressive street art, you know, so um, I, I didn't want to do it then, but I finally got the green light from the campaign, not, my poster wasn't an official campaign poster, it was just a grassroots poster, but they gave me the go ahead at, uh, in the middle of uh, January, so um, I think there'd only been one primary at that point, um, and, uh, and then I got started getting my stuff out there. So, um, you know, I, 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 oh, I'm not a cheerleader for Obama. I'm not completely happy with everything he's doing. I still think it's far better than if McCain were president. Um, but Obama being president is a step in the right direction. It's a foot in the door. It's not Obama's got to fix the country. We have to fix the country. So I'm making, I'm still working with moveon.org, making clean energy posters and making my own art for Sea Shepherd and uh, human rights in Burma and plenty of other things that I hope that Obama will get around to really doing some meaningful things with, but I'm not leaving, I'm not waiting for Obama to do it. I'm doing what I can. Oh, hi. Yeah, <laughs> Obama. We have time Thank for you. one last question. Yes, it seems that uh, you honestly throughout your car career have been taking risk and, you know, it, um, all these Hoopa lose about, you know, the Associate Press with Obama poster and being arrested in Boston. It seems that it's, it's just, a, you know, um, make you much, you know, a better artist. And all these Hoopa lose has been more um, forward to your career than detr detrimental to your career. Is that correct? Um, if I have any money left after the, the AP lawsuit and I'm still able to make work, then, you know, I'll be happy. Um, it's a really stressful situation, and yeah, it's, it's raised my profile, but it's, um, it's hard to concentrate, um, and, and you know, it's, it's created a, a huge amount of anxiety for me. I mean, I make light of it a lot, but it's been hard for me to sleep a good bit, but, you know, if I, if I make it through this, um, and, and uh, you know, I'm really fighting for the rights of artists in this, in this case with the AP, and it's a complicated issue. I believe in intellectual property, but I also believe in uh, po political speech. Political speech is incredibly important. So, um, you know, where intellectual property and, 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 uh, and you know, political speech and, and, you know, First Amendment rights in general, because artists don't use words to express their point of view, they use pictures. Um, they need, to, they need to find a happy medium. And, um, and I'm sensitive to both sides of the argument, but in the case of that Obama poster, I know which side I'm on. Um, but you know, it's uh, it, it's it's I, all, I'm focusing on the things in my life I have control over. <laughs> I think that's what uh, on, the only thing anyone can do. And you, uh, you know, I, I I try not to have regrets. I try not to second guess any of the decisions I've made. Um, but uh, and just learn and move forward. Shepard, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you want to see Shepherd's murals, they're, they're over in uh, the Wynwood District, uh, Northwest 2nd Ave and 26th Street. Yeah, and there's another one at uh, 31st and North Miami. Three 80-foot murals. 